but why don't we get started? Today, we are very happy to welcome Michelle Song for another week of virtual quant marketing seminar. Uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, search advertising and non-strategic behaviors. So as just as a reminder, as usual, if you are joining as attendee, please put your questions in the Q&A feature and we'll ask the questions on your behalf. And for those of us on the panel, please feel free to unmute and ask questions during the talk. Uh, we'll go about an hour for the formal part of the presentation. And then after that, we'll have a more informal discussions. And for any people wanting to join us for that, you're welcome to stick around and we'll have a more informal discussion afterwards. Uh, with that, welcome, Michelle. You can get started. Thank you. Thanks, Jilin, for introducing me. And hi, everyone. Michelle, I'm from Boston College, and I'm very excited to share uh, this work on information disclosure in the search advertising market with some uh, strategic and non-strategic behaviors from bidders. And this is a joint work with uh, my PhD cohort back at Stanford, Ming Xizhu, um, and actually, she's going to join um, Georgia Tech IS department this summer. So with that, let me start. Okay, so, um, so you guys can see my Google search page. So um, online search advertising is a huge market and it's everywhere in our daily life. For example, I have a dog. Whenever I search for dog treat on Google, the first set of results showed in front of me are actually sponsored search ad results. So this is a huge market. Uh, in the past year, it's over a hundred billion dollars now in the US. And in China, it's half of that market size, over $50 billion. And um, for advertisers, uh, whenever they are uh, big corporations like Amazon or Chewy or you know, Nike or small business owners, if they want to advertise on these kind of search ad platforms, they have to go through um, an auction to uh, bid for ad slots. So it's actually a pretty complex auction format. Uh, Google started this so-called generalized second price auction, and later they introduced the quality score adjustment for um, bidders. And um, so for an advertisers to bidding this auction, they have to form some knowledge about how others are bidding right now, as well as how the general you know, quality score distribution looks like for the entire market. So it's gonna be a very challenging task because it requires a lot of professional knowledge. And search ad platforms, they realized about this problem. Um, they offer these following two schemes or solutions for advertisers. One solution is to um, ask some information from bidders. For example, they let bidders to sp specify an ad budget, the maximum amount of bid they are willing to put, and the target goals. For example, number of clicks or impressions they wanna hit. Um, and then the platform like Twitter, Facebook, Yelp, they're gonna uh, serve as a bidding agent for uh, advertisers and are gonna bid on behalf of them. The other platform, which will be uh, the other kind of information scheme, which will be the focus of today's talk, is the self bidding with information disclosure. So, meaning that platforms they are gonna share information about the um, general, you know, competitive um, bid environment uh, with bidders. For example, for example, Google started this so-called first page bid estimates with advertisers to give them a sense of how much they want to bid to get on the first page. Also, um, my data provider, a large Yelp-like platform in China, shares a similar type of information about you know, the competitive bidding environment with bidders. And then these informed advertisers, they are going to bid by themselves. So despite you know, this huge market size, and also um, the difficulty uh, lying in front of bidders, um, we still don't really know, you know how effective these information sharing with bidders work for them, as well as for the entire market outcomes. For example, you know, how it's gonna change the market, advertisers, ad platforms revenue, sorry, 
as well as you know the market effic efficiencies. So today, um, in this project, we are interested in tackle these set of questions. So first off, we are going to ask the question of the impact of sharing information about competitive bidding environment on the platform's revenue. And next, we are going to delve deeper and see how different bidders react to this information. And thirdly, uh, we want to work a step further and then evaluate actually the impact on other market outcomes like e efficiency. And lastly, um, if that's somewhat inefficient, how can we design a better information sharing um, policy with these advertisers? So let me give you a general overview of how I approach these problems. And um, for sure, I will share the details of each of the steps in the um, later part of the discussion. So first off, we um, collaborated this with this large Yelp like platform in China where users are gonna you know, hop on the platform searching for all sorts of lifestyle services like restaurants and takeouts and sometimes wedding service, which is gonna be our focused category. And this is a huge platform. Uh, it has 500 million users on one side, as well as 7 million merchants on the other side. So um, this platform, um, they started sharing the information with um, advertisers in one city. Basically, they provide the bid recommendations for top three ad positions. And what we observe in the market is um, in that city where we observe information, we found bidders bid increase by 35% um, and the ad price increased by 19%, which is gonna be you know, some proxy for the platform's revenue. So to delve into what really happens um, with these individual advertisers, we first um, theoretically comes up with this um, knowledge that actually exactly follow what the platform tells them to do, you know, basically follow these three bid recommendations is shown under the theory is a suboptimal behavior for bidders to do that. However, in practice, we still find, you know, actually a large proportion of them, 47% of high valued bidders, um, they actually have done at least once, you know, follow those bid recommendations and this is out of total of the bid change occasions is 14% of the times they follow that. So it's not every time they're gonna follow whatever the platform tells them to do, but um, there's a still a, a large amount of times they are going to do that, which is shown that is theoret theoretically suboptimal. Um, also, we found a different group, you know, the other, uh, high value the bidders, they didn't follow at all. So they see the information, they adjusted their bids with more sophisticated sophistication, but they never follow uh, these bid recommendations. And, um, you know, to understand how it affects the market efficiency, we need a structural model to back out their valuation first. And so we come up with a structural model to identify values with uh, the sophisticated group. And also we leverage, leverage our uh, unique data setting to identify values for the less sophisticated group. And lastly, we come you, we, through the counterfactual analysis, we are able to say something about the importance of you know, carefully managing these information with bidders whenever there exist uh, you know, heterogeneous groups, sometimes non-strategic behaviors. So um, with that, um, I'm going to pause for some high-level questions here uh, before we delve into you know, specific settings, data, and empirical observations. So Michelle, can you say a bit more about how the recommendations are given, or does that matter in your context? Um, yeah, I think matter a little bit. Uh, I think you will have um, way more concrete idea when we and reach to the slides where I'm going to show you how the information is shown to the advertisers. Michelle, this is super interesting. Oh, 
Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what's the sort of at a high level, what's the source of uh, sophistication or lack of sophistication? Is it that people don't know um, how much you're bidding or uh, how much they should be bidding? Or is it that, you know, the optimal uh, policy, like, uh, like how much you bid depending on some kind of state is too sophisticated. So uh, people use some kind of simple heuristics. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So here I'm defining sophistication based on whether or not you have followed that bid recommendations ever in our data set. The reason is because we have shown, you know, later you will see it's not up, it's suboptimal for them to follow, follow the bid recommendations. There could be other reasons to follow that, but it's if they're maximizing their payoff, it's not optimal to follow that. So um, if you have ever followed that, you are called less sophisticated group. Uh, if you haven't followed that and you're on this high value bidders, which means that um, they have bid above these bid recommendations before, but they never bid exactly at the cutoff. They're called sophisticated group. Um, following up on your thanks question, um, I'm, so I'm thinking suboptimality can come from two uh, main sources. One might be that um, they they just don't have good enough information. Um, they just have like landscape of the bit uh, distribution, but not necessarily, for example, like each of my competitors is bidding how much mm -hmm. um, for each individual uh, competitor. So that will be lack of information, which I think it's part of what you are suggesting for the platform, whether or not to disclose. Um, less or more information. The other part might be that even though, if, even if I have 100% information, let's say I know exactly what others are bidding, like how others are acting, I might not be uh, sophisticated enough in order to come up with an optimal bid for under this particular auction uh, mm -hmm. mechanism. So mm -hmm. Uh, that's lack of maybe a lack of knowledge about auction theory. So I don't, even though I have information, I don't know what to do with this information, how much to bid. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering like how you think about these two sources of uh, suboptimality in this context. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And um, as you will see later, um, I'm gone, not going to define sophistication based on whether they're gonna they're bidding optimally but um i figure that if they're following that bid recommendation it's definitely not optimal for them to do that so that's how i define they are less sophisticated and as i i don't have any data to really identify whether they are doing optimal way but i'm gonna assume the other group is perform some more sophistication around bidding and i'm gonna that's my assumption and i'm gonna build a model of their struck, you know, strategic bidding in the the auction to identify their valuations. Michelle, I have a question as well, which is, um, you know, are there um, are there cases where uh, there are bidders who are actually reducing their bid when they see recommendations, uh, even though an average is showed that bids go up? Is it, uh, or is is it mostly people are increasing their bids? If so. Do you have a kind of a high level theory for why that might be the case? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, we we mostly focus on average level. We see their average level increasing, um, but it would be interesting to delve deeper to see if there's, I definitely see variations in the bid level among this group. And yeah, I, I, I think I, I can check that to see Maybe that's going to show some interesting pattern for us. Thank you. All right. I, I think um, now I'm going to show you more um, background information about what the platform looks like, as well as how this information is introduced to advertisers. So again, this is the Yelp like platform. Uh, we are focusing on the wedding service category because that's where the information is introduced. So um, if I search for wedding service here, um, I'm going to be shown these search results in front of me. Actually, on this platform, all top five positions are allocated to ads. So you can see this 
very non-salient logo here, which show, says that this is an ad. And um, so if I scroll down, I can see more um, non-ad results. So on this platform, they also run generalized second price auction with quality score adjustment. I just want to give you a quick review of how this works um, for on this platform. So for example, we have three advertisers, red hair, green hair, and black hair. And they first off, they submit bid um, through the system. And if they don't change that, the platform is going to recognize you know, that's their bid unless the next time they change it. So um, the quality score is introduced by the platform whenever there's a search query you know, for these advertisers happen. So whenever a user start a search query, the platform is gonna you know, assign quality scores for different advertisers. And um, this quality score is sort of like a click-through rate between a user and a specific advertiser. And then the rank score is computed as quality score times bid. So the platform is now gonna decide which advertiser is gonna occupy the first, second versus third position based on this rank score here. Okay, so the payment um, is gonna be, because this is second price, it's gonna be per click price is determined by the second highest rank score adjust by your own quality score this time. The total payment is gonna be on the clicks times per click price, okay? So for Bob's wedding photography, who occupied the first position, the payment is 100 number of clicks times per click, the second highest rank score divided by his um, quality score, okay? Similarly, the uh, Tom's payment is gonna be um, like this, okay? So um, that's the auction format. And then the platform um, introduced this recommend bid recommendations to advertisers in the city called Xi'an for more than a month and kept unknown in other cities. So we come up with a comparable city, Chengdu, to compare with Xi'an. And here is the bidding page advertisers in Xi'an saw after the policy introduced in the city. So before they only see this bid section, they put bid here. This is the reservation price. After policy change, they're going to see today's bid recommendations for first, second, third positions. And here is the bid recommendation per click um, for first position. So to Jingling's question, actually the platform specifically designed this button, use this price. So you can click on this button and this price will automatically become your bid there. So it makes a little bit easier for them to you know, use this price. Um, so that's um, how the policy intervention works for advertisers. Okay, so maybe you're wondering how, this, um, how the platform comes up with bid recommendations. So let's go back to that uh, previous example to show you how exactly the platform comes up with this um, bid recommendations. So first off, the platform follows a sort of you know, scientific way. Um, they um, extract the yesterday's bids from the system, okay? Let's say they didn't change bid over time from yesterday to today, and it's still 10 for two. Now the platforms, because they change and consumer change. So now the new quality score is gonna be 0 0.5, 0 0.8, and 0 0.2 for three advertisers. So today's rank score is gonna be five, 3.2, and 0.4. It's gonna be different from yesterday because quality score changes. So for Bob, he's gonna see a recommended um, price for first, second, and three position based on now the second highest rank score divided by his new quality score today. So now he's gonna see 6.4 per click for the first position as well as second position, third position. Similarly for Tom, he's gonna see, you know, the same second highest quality score, rank score divided by his quality score, okay? So if you click on this price, 
if both of them click on this price, you can see they are going to reach the same rank score if their quality score doesn't change much. OK, so um, this is and um, just a side note, this is known to the, the mechanism or how the platform comes up with bid recommendations is known to advertisers. OK, so as I said, if both of them. Michelle, if you have a few questions from the panelists, this, uh... Is this a good time to pause and take some questions? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so I can go first. And then, um, so I just have a clarification question um, sure. regarding kind of how the bids are shown. So it seems like the um, recommendations are kind of specific to each bidder based on kind of their current quality score, uh, quality score of the day. Is that right? Yes. Um, okay, and then I think one, I guess like, well, I guess like one question that I had before is that, well, kind of whether kind of the bit recommendation is optimized to kind of maximize the winning, but then kind of for the advertisers, well, it like their objective is not necessarily kind of winning the slot every time, yeah. right? So, so I'm not sure how to think about kind of what is optimal here yet. Yeah, um, good point. And um, I think in two slides, you will see the exact reason why this is not optimal very intuitively. Um, if, is there any questions? I can definitely go ahead and in the, probably next slide, you will see why this is not optimal for them to do that. And um, another short answer is the the platform doesn't design this information to optimize each advertiser's utility it's just showing them you know historically what is the highest bid adjust by your today's quality score yeah yeah so um and then just a follow up so for example if i look at say kind of you know google when they provide the kind of you know smart, smart bidding uh kind of algorithms they would say well i have kind of several different algorithms each one is going to optimize a different objective. And here, so what do the advertisers know when they see the recommendations? So are, for instance, is the platform going to say, well, this is the recommendation that is going to maximize something? Um, it's not maximizing for anything. It's just showing you how competitive the current bidding environment looks like, right? Today, um, I might see 6.4 and yesterday I might see three. It's probably because everybody is bidding higher or it's, it could be because my quality score is dropping today. So um, from this information, it's actually very hard to, for them to tell which factor is dominating which. So it's some information, but it's definitely not uh, full information shown to advertisers. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Hello, Michelle. This is Dennis yeah. here. Uh, it, yeah, it's actually nice to see Xi'an. I was born there a couple of, uh, I mean, long time ago. But anyway, so um, so I have two questions. One is pretty simple. So it seems like the RS is uh, RS two depends on individual impression of the user coming in, right? Are, are they just taking a weighted average across all the populations, then divided by the score of this particular seller? That's the first question. And second question is more involved. It's like, how can I think about the uh, uh, budget allocation problem of the sellers? Because unlike uh, Google, uh, in those platforms, I assume this is Meituan, given the, the number of users you are saying, uh, they have many ways of advertising their, their shops. They can direct giving uh, uh, red pockets to people. They can actually purchase banner ads on top of the, of the screen. They can, they can purchase this ads. How, how do I think about the budget allocation in the process and how this could uh, affect, how do we define optimality of bidding? Um, okay, so first to your first question, you're right, it's a weighted average. Um, actually, it, it's, they simulate a group of users and um, select a number for a quality score. And second question in terms of um, budget allocation, uh, we didn't, factor that into our model when we decide optimal bid for in this um, process. Um, the reason is because I think they can adjust their bid here. And then 
in the previous page or the la later page, I didn't remember exactly, they can also adjust their budget. So these two things, they can vary. And we observe in the data, I remember when they are bid price, we also observe the budget rising. So um, um, yeah, maybe we can talk more about the budget. Um, yeah, one quick question. Do you observe their spending on other channels? If so, do you observe the, the proportion of spending in this ads is constant? for one seller over time? Um, we mostly observe one or two ads by each advertiser. So, um, and a lot of them only have one ad. And, and this is wedding service providers. So, so you can think of them mostly as small business owners who only have one or two shops. On okay, perfect, website. thanks. All right, Michelle? thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's Kayo here. I have a very quick question Hi. along the lines of what Tessary said. So. The platform is doing this. It's not maximizing the bidder's payoffs. It's not maximizing its own payoff, payoffs, presumably. Do you have a sense of what the, the bidders believe? Um, um, so the information I have is they know like uh, how the platform comes up with this process as it's just like what I show you here. Um, I think, um, they should they, they should have been informed that this is not like an optimized price for them. It's just some information for them. And I assume they know that. That's yeah. Okay. So they don't believe that this is done for the benefit of the platform only. Um some of them might have this thoughts, but I can really observe that in the data. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. So um, let let me show you why this is or is not optimal. So a quick example here. Um, back quick following example. Um, the first bid, per, first position bid recommendation was six point four for Bob and four for Tom Wright. So if both of them follow they are gonna end up as the same rank score. So how the platform decide under those case, they're gonna tie break randomly. So if I'm Tom here, I just add one cent to my bid, I'm gonna have a higher rank score here. So why not do that? Why not just follow the bid recommendation? Why not just add one cent to my bid, right? So this is the intuition why this is optimal, suboptimal, but the more, you know, uh, strict, restrict um, proof is here. If in those cases they end up at the same rank score by following the bid recommendations, the platform is gonna tie break or sometimes there's variation in quality score. Like every time a user arrives, right? Their quality score is gonna change. So the variance in the quality score is gonna actually decide or determine which position they're gonna later. So if we assume like this quality score distribution is atomless, then uh, it will give us the um, intuition that it's not optimal or they're like following that cutoff is a probability zero event as a best response for each bidder. Make sense? So um, if that makes sense, we are gonna go ahead and look at what really happens in the real world data. So um, first off, a sum summarization of the data we have. So it's a month before an experiment happened until um, October 10th, 2019. And um, we have bid change occasion data, meaning that every time they log into their system, when they change their bid, we observe the original bid, the changed bid, and you know the three displayed bid recommendations as well as the total budget. Also, we observe daily advertisers' performance in terms their, of their click-through rate, cost per click, quality score, and the position, average position displayed on that day. And advertisers' characteristic data, we have their review rate over time, review numbers, stars, and the then how long they stay on the platform, you know, whether they're new or experienced advertisers. 
So what we observe in the data is here. We have found evidence of suboptimal bidding behavior. Basically, we plotted, you know, the bid change occasion data. We plotted this difference between the changed bid and the three bid recommendation they observe. If you see this uh, zero cutoff, that means that they use the bid recommendation S1 as their bid for today. So this density among the three zeros shows us that this is like people follow bid recommendations sometimes. So we figure this 88 advertisers, high value advertisers, meaning that they have at least, you know, in the past bid greater than the lowest bid recommendation. So they are not, because if their bid way lower than the bid recommendations, we cannot really figure out if it's because their valuation is too low or it's because they, they are bidding sophisticatedly, but they don't, you know, they don't, they don't really follow that. So we have to focus on those high value groups where we observe they actually have bid higher than this cutoff before. And that's, that gives 187 advertisers, 88 out of them have followed recommendations at least once. And this three things composed of 14% of the total bid change occasions. So we, so the previous questions was around, you know, what, how I define sophisticated versus less sophisticated. So this group, 88 advertisers, I call them less sophisticated groups. The rest of the 187 advertisers, um, because they never ever, you know, follow the bid recommendations. So it seems it indicates some level of sophistication. So they anticipate that there's gonna be high competition at the top. So in order to ensure that I can get the top positions, I know there's gonna be some people bidding here. So I, why not just bid a little bit more than these group of people and I have a higher likelihood of winning the top positions. Okay, so these group of people, we call them sophisticated group. So let's first look at how this information impact the market um, in general. So in terms of how it affects bid and cost per click. Michelle, there are a couple of questions. So maybe it's a good time to take those. Sounds good, yeah. Um, yeah, Michelle, I just had a quick question, which is it's this, um, this bid recommendations came as part of an experiment, right? For a short period of time. Yeah. So, would, uh, so I'm just wondering if advertisers just kind of um, see these come up uh, and and think that they can, they, they might want to experiment with it, see what it uh, leads to and is it, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand if is it if, if it can really be interpreted as sophistication or lack of that, or merely that you know the this information is provided and as part of their regular experimentation they they try it out and see what it leads to. Um, yeah, so you're talking about understanding more about you know why they do that, but. Um, first off, if they are experimenting, you know, with following that to learn something, for example, if they're learning, maybe people say they're learning quality scores or bid, you know, the bidding environment, I would say there's no need to follow that because the information is shown there. By following that, you, you, the information should show there, like if you price, you, you, um, bid at this price, you're probably gonna get top position or second position or third position, okay? So you can look at that information and learn something, but there's no need to follow that to learn, you know, the either quality score distribution or bid distribution because it's it's costly for you. I was thinking more along the lines of what Kai was asking earlier. So uh, do they kind of, what do they infer from this information? Um, about you know why the the platform's own 
motivation for doing it or what it's um, um, or more generally what the information is is it true uh, and so on so they could be learning anyway i'll just uh, stop here but I, I was just wondering more generally um, yeah. how we can kind of interpret from bids something about level of sophistication versus not so i'll i'll stop here and let you proceed and i i might follow up later okay sounds good um yeah um maybe later you will see more cl clearly um here i want to mention that we didn't really take an extent on why they do that as you know we don't really have enough data to figure out why they did that so there's a lot of explanation to do that we can rule out some explanations but not all of them and the level of sophistication is mainly defined that this is not optimal for them to follow that if they want to learn information or other things. So yeah, that's our definition of sophistication here. Okay, so let me move on and um, quickly show you the you know general impact on bid and cost per clicks. So here is the difference in difference um, regression, which um, used to study the impact on bid and cost per clicks. The main effect we care about is this heterogeneous tre treatment effect on different groups. So those ad who are in the top versus mid versus lower positions, because what our priors are that um, because this is information about top positions, it's going to mainly influence those ad who are located on the top. And um, consistent with our hypothesis, I think generally the bid increase happened um, in the city where they observed information and compare with the pre policy level is actually 35% increase, which is um, significant. And um, you know it, the bid increase significantly most for the first group, the group who have their ad located on the top five positions. And similarly for the ad price cost per clicks increased by um, 0.67 RMB, which is equivalent to 19% pre-policy level. And this increased by 1.9 more in the um, top group. So that's the impact on the market. If we delve deeper into how the bid level change between the sophisticated versus less sophisticated group, we can see the pattern that this red line, which shows us this less sophisticated group, they raised their bid way more than the sophisticated group. And um, you can see that this is the control city level, which means they, you know, they are pretty similar to the sophisticated group. They didn't change the bit very much. So this graph actually tells us the intuition behind why the market price increased. So basically that, that red group, they follow the bid recommendation and raise their bid compared to the previous level. So the competition among the top slots increase. That's why we observe generally the market price increase. Michelle, can I have a question here? Sure. Um, so I, I kept thinking about kind of what I guess I straight was asking and also kind of what Kyle was asking before. So kind of I think like one way that I would think about kind of the kind of uh, sophistication here is that, well, it's not necessarily defined by adherence but uh, kind of in terms of like how they use the information to update their previous bid. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a Bayesian bidder, um, kind of suppose they are kind of you know, acting in a rational way, they know that, well, the recommendation has some information, but, um, but it's necessarily kind of, you know, like a, kind of the best is not necessarily literally kind of the optimal bid that I should uh, use. So then mm -hmm. kind of if you see that, I guess that one way that I would want to look at the data is actually looking at kind of how similar bidders in the treatment and control actually adjust their bid with or without the recommendation mm -hmm. rather than just kind of the final bid themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, we we definitely had, um, you know, digging into the data and show different patterns of these two groups of bidders, right? One who has ever followed, one has never followed. 
to show their bid. We we have plotted this bid patterns relative to the three bid recommendations. It's uh, we didn't really see a consistent pattern among you know different bidders. Some bidders sometimes follow them. Some bidders in the beginning they would follow that, and later they just um, start with their own bid. And some bidders they never follow that. So we don't really quite see this consistent pattern, even between new versus experienced bidders, we don't see, figure out this, um, you know, a consistent pattern. So I think there's a lot of hypothesis going on. I definitely agree with uh, you and uh, Schrader's hypothesis that could happen. It's just, we cannot observe that in the data. And I think um, what you suggest is actually described as sophisticated behavior here. So you see information, uh, you adjust your bid around that, but you don't follow that. That's the level of sophistication here. Yeah, and I think that what you say about kind of, you know, some bidders initially adopt the recommendation and later abandon that. I think that's interesting because that also reminds me of uh, Yufeng's paper that kind of studies the Airbnb kind of, um, kind of, how the uh, host adopt the Airbnb pricing. So if I find that, well, the recommendations are not um, really working for me because, well, they're maximizing kind of the bidding probability, but my goal is actually to maximize, I guess, kind of, you know, the revenue for, well, kind of the profit from the advertising. The two objectives are not necessarily online. And then after learning, I could abandon that and that is optimal. Yeah. Yeah, I observed two or three people do that out of the 88 people, but you know, the data sample is not that huge. And um, the other group also did a, another way, which is kind of randomly adopt that. So we, we don't really take a stance on different kinds of behavior here. Yeah, that's our... Um, um, yes, Andre, you have a question? Yeah, the, just a very quick one. It's about inference here. Um, <clears throat> you clustered the standard errors at an advertiser level, but the treatment was assigned at a city level. Yes. Um, so I'm very worried about that. And then this also makes me raise, like, think about, like, why did you pick the other city as the control city? Don't you have many donor cities? Like, wouldn't the natural strategy here to be to use synthetic controls and uh, take, like, a weighted average of the different cities that are on the platform and you know, use that? Yeah, I think um, the main reason we did here is, was because um, we actually selected this comparable city before they run this experiment. And we used the pre-experiment data, like uh, average daily bid and CPC cost per clicks in different cities to select, a, to find this match city. And we can definitely, yeah, I think that's a good suggestion that like we can use other cities as comparison to, yeah. In terms of the standard arrow, I guess, yeah, that's because the treatment happens, the treatment happens at the city level, but, you know, if we cluster at that level, that's basically just one pair of comparison. So, yeah, but that's not a good justification for clustering at advertiser level. I'm sorry, like. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I guess um, that's, maybe we can think more about that and find other comparable cities to start with. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, Michelle, there's also a question from the audience, but I also see you're short on time. If it's like a quick thing can, you can address, otherwise feel free to uh, push push back. The question is, why is a sophistication only overbidding from this histogram? Uh, there for the top position, there are a lot a lot of densities on the lower bidding, but for the third position, more yeah. density is on the oversight. So wondering how does that depend on the positions? Yeah, I can definitely explain that, clarify that. So that's just a picture, but um, in the data, I define sophistication as those who has never um, done this bid at the cutoff behavior. So the left group is also included here as sophisticated group. So um, yeah, so in order to know how it affects the market efficiency, we need a structural model to learn their value, right? So here is um, 
first off, we assume these sophisticated bidders are rational expect utility maximizers. And so here is the expected payoff for these bidders with valuation V and who bid B. So basically it's just a payoff per click times the probability that you're going to occupy the case position. The main intervention, main invention here is we model the joint likelihood of um, RK minus one RK rank score distribution, the joint um, likelihood of the rank score distribution here. And so it helps us to arise at this profit function for bidders. And then uh, we make sure this um, first order condition satisfied a single housing property gives us a nice value identification function from the data. So um, we can observe the bid distribution here. The second part, the, this part, the positive markup term is also observed from data. So the good thing is we can use the data to back out the value distribution for this group, which we call sophisticated group. Here is what we find um, after estimation. On the left is the empirical bid distribution. So this part. And on the right is the estimated value distribution. You can see they're very similar, which suggests that the empirical distribution is a big part that drives this bimodal distribution on the right. And in terms of that group, right, the less sophisticated group, we cannot really enforce a bidding strategy or bidding model for them. However, we can leverage the data set because in every bid occasions, we can observe their bid and the three bid recommendations they observe, right? So we can say, based on these two main assumptions, first, they do not, they never overbid than their valuation. So some level of sophistication here or rationality here, you, you don't bid over your valuation. Secondly, you, you do not want your opponent win at a price that you are willing to match. Based on these two assumptions, we can um, figure out their lower bound of their bid valuation, which is their bid, and then the upper bound of the valuation, which is the, um, the closest, highest, um, higher bid recommendations. So let me give an example. If in this occasion, I observe somebody bidding between S3 and S2, so the third position bid recommendation and second position bid recommendation, and I observe his bid is in between. Then I, this information will give us the lower bound of his valuation, which is B here. And then the upper bound of valuation is the uh, second highest, second um, bid recommendation that he did not take. Okay, so that gives us the upper bound and lower bound of their valuation. So here is what I found for this less sophisticated group, their valuation distribution. Um, okay, so in terms of their bidding strategy, we, we, we can figure out their um, valuation based on the data. However, we can really, cannot really, you know, enforce too much in terms of how they bid from the data because they're bidding sort of here and there randomly. So we proposed the two models. First is more data-driven model. We, um, the second is more ad hoc. We assume just assume they randomly bid. So the first model, we, because we know V here, we already figure out the upper bound, lower bound of value distribution for them. We observe their bid, right? So we can first force by assuming that their bid rising with their valuation, which is also you know, a, a rational assumption for them. So whenever you have higher bid, your, you have higher valuation, sorry, your bid is gonna increase, okay? So um, from that, we are gonna fit a bidding distribution for them, or we just assume they bid randomly. So they bid according to their valuation, but this alpha is gonna be drawn from a uniform distribution. So random shade strategy. So the only assumption here is that they're randomly bid below their valuation, okay? So Michelle? from, yes. Michelle. Uh how crucial is the private values assumption here? Um, for, for estimation, I understand, but. 
you mean here, right? Yeah, I understand for estimation, but for the content of the model and the predictions, how important this is? Um, I guess, so in the, you mean in for the counterfactual, how important that is? Uh, yeah. So in the counterfactual, actually, I don't, so this is a way for us to empirically figure out their uh, value distribution, but actually in the mm -hmm. counterfactual, we assume they're bidding in the uh, locally free MV equilibrium, um, which is um, the most beneficial equilibrium for the ad platform. So we just choose an equilibrium for them to play in the counterfactual and compare that to the relative baseline. So I guess in that sense, it's not that relevant. It's not relevant. So they know their valuations, they bid according to that. If they didn't know really their valuations, it would make a difference. Um, so I think the strategy makes a difference, but their valuation, the, the notion that they know their private valuation is consistent across different scenarios. So maybe okay. you'll be more clear when I talk about the counterfactual. Sure, thank yeah. you. So in the counterfactual, as I said, the less sophisticated group, they're gonna bid sort of less sophisticatedly. Um, I don't assume any equilibrium bidding behavior for this group. They, when they see their value is higher than three bid recommendations, they take the highest bid recommendation, you know, to increase their likelihood to win top positions. If their value is too high, they just do their own, you know, fitted or random bidding strategy. The other sophisticated group, they realize there exists this group of here. Okay, so now with that knowledge, we are going to bid in equilibrium with the equilibrium bidding strategy proposed by um, Adam Ostrovsky and Schwartz. So that's the rule we play in the counterfactual. And so we suggest alternative mechanisms, which I think due to time constraint, I can explain better here. Um, here, um, I assume less sophisticated ones, they're doing somewhat rational way. They're performing whenever they have higher bid, higher value, they put higher bid. So pre-intervention, this is the baseline, no information at all. We just simulate this result because we don't know in data which kind of equilibrium, because this is a multiple equilibrium game. We didn't know which kind of equilibrium play there. So we just simulate that in a pre-intervention case, no information, everybody bid on their own, under their own strategy. This is the ad platform revenue and social surplus here. And um, first off, we simulate the, the policy intervention mentioned in the data. Um, when they introduce, when the platform introduced historically three highest bid, okay. And um, here we observe, similar to the empirical data we observed, platform revenue increased by 3% here. And then interestingly, social surpluses decreased by 32%. So basically it's saying that by introducing this information, the market is becoming less efficient. The intuition here is basically this picture I have shown you over and over time. So this dense mass at this place in order to you know figure out who's going to win position at these for those of people who danced here the platform is going to do tiebreakers so the basically the inefficiency is introduced by these tiebreakers because now the higher valued ones are not guaranteed a higher position relative to lower valued ones so the inefficiency is mainly caused by you know a platform introduce a low bid recommendation and everyone is bidding here. Not everyone, but a lot of people are bidding here. Okay, so um, realizing that um, here is what we th think about. 
So the intuition is we, we are not introducing some, first off, we are not introducing some optimal strategy here. So I think for figuring out an optimal strategy, it's for maybe next paper. But here we are thinking about intuitively, what can we do better, right? So intuitively, what can be made better is those higher valued ones are getting higher positions, okay? So we tell them not the historical highest bid estimates, but, but rather we tell them the highest of three expected values for these um, advertisers. And now we can see the revenue increase further and social surplus get increased. Okay, so another intuition is why not we just share the full information about all the ad positions. And if we assume a group of people are gonna follow that, we can see revenue increase further and social surplus increase more. The last situation or the counterfactual scenario is sort of mimicking the auto bidding scheme, but this is sort of a more extreme case where we know everybody's valuation, okay? So they just tell me their private value and I'm gonna bid for them, basically their valuation. And here we are achieving a little bit more revenue for the ad platform, but not more so social surpluses. So the last case is sort of more extreme. Um, in the reality, it's probably not possible for the platform to know everybody's valuation. Everybody's not gonna choose fully reveal their valuation. But I think a more realistic way for them to do is to share information um, around the value distribution for the top ad slots. Okay, so um, due to time constraint, I'm gonna conclude quickly here and I'm gonna open for questions. So hopefully I convince you that um, there is some impact of information disclosure in the generalized and price auctions, okay? So empirically, we observe bid and ad price increase. And um, interestingly, we find some suboptimal bidding behavior. Some people just follow bid recommendations and this behavior actually increased the competition for all the top slots. And um, using a structural model, we are able to, um, use the model and leverage on the data to identify the value uh, distribution for two groups of bidders. And using the counterfactuals, we are able to tell something about, you know, how this information affect the market. So I guess the insight from the counterfactual analysis is first, um, the platform should encourage bidders to bid according to their valuations. So try to encourage them, nudge them to move towards the second price auction. And um, secondly, um, the platform should think about reducing this dense mass at the cutoff because this is the where the part, you know, the, the inefficiency is coming from. So again, they can use bid recommendations based on estimated value, not just on the historical bids. And also they can introduce information for more ad slot. Lastly, if possible, I think um, they can bid for them if they know the valuation of each advertisers. So thank you. And I think I can um, open up for questions now. Great, uh, thank you for presenting this very interesting paper. As you can tell, there are a lot of discussions, questions. Uh, let me stop recording now and we will go for uh, some more informal discussions. And for those in the uh, attendees, you can also feel free to uh, raise your hand and I'll promote you to uh, join the discussion.